Christmas world and Christmas season, they're doing a really great job right now of rebranding Christmas. Uh, if, you, if you listen to the messaging, you look at the advertisements, you go to the stores, you look at the movies, they're doing a great job trying to say that Jesus is part of the reason for the season. Or everything's about just the festivities, the giving and the get-togethers and the uh, Giving Tuesdays and the Small Business Saturdays and all this stuff. It's all, it's all about, uh, just, it's just a good time of year. It's about Santa Claus. It's about reindeer. It's about Hallmark movies. It's all about all the stuff. Listen, we are here today at church because we realize that Christmas is not all about all that stuff. Uh, Christmas is about Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. I love to say it that way. I saw it on a bumper sticker my whole life. Jesus is the reason for the season. That is the only reason for the season. And I want to talk about it a little bit today. Um, I, I want to read this story in Luke chapter 2. I just have to tell you, it's not just a story. It is a historical account of what took place. Uh, I, some of you in here, maybe you're new to church and this is like you came with a friend and you thought this is a good thing to do. Let's come to church. Or maybe you're watching online because somebody shared a link. Uh, this story we're about to read is the story of Christmas. And I really do hope that as parents, and those of you in here, I know this is the service where most of the parents come to. Listen, if you have children, I sure hope they know why Christmas is here. I sure hope they know the reason. This story is the story where you can read to them on Christmas Eve, on Christmas Day. This is it. Let's read it together. I'm going to start in verse number 8 of Luke chapter 2. The Bible says in Luke 2 verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Listen, um, this is the Christmas story. This is the reason for the season. And I want to focus our attention today on the Lord. I, I, want, to, I want to take a, a moment of time, and we all have a moment of time here today. And God, I know God has you here for a reason, to adore Him. Take your, listen, we have some pretty trees up here. I like these little trees. I like the lights. I like all the stuff, of the hustle and bustle of Christmas. But we need to stop and pause and set our eyes on what it is all really about and uh, look at him for a little bit today. Let's pray and we'll get into the message. Father, I come to you for all of us that are listening, those that are watching. And God, I just pray for our families. I pray for our homes. I pray, God, that this season would be something we understand clearly as to what the purpose is and why we, why we look toward you. And God, I pray that today as we look at you as the anointed one, the Christ, I pray you just... If anybody in here today doesn't know you as Savior, I pray they come to know you as Savior. God, if anybody in here today is living for anything else besides you, I pray that you'd help us all to see uh, what you want us to know today. God, teach us. I pray for anyone discouraged, you'd encourage them. I pray you'd lift them up. I pray you'd equip them for the task you have for them today. Lord, we need you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in verse 11 of this story... We read a name of, uh, of Jesus that we hear and we, we sing about and we hear it so often. But I wonder if we know what it is. And, and so the Bible says in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Christ. We say it all the time. We pray it, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing Christ this and Christ that. 
What is Christ anyway? What does that mean? Is, G- is, is Christ like his last name? You know, Jesus Christ. You know, maybe you never really considered what Christ was and what this name is. Is Christ simply just uh, another religious term that we use? We just use it, you know, Jesus, Christ, maybe they're interchangeable, right? Maybe. It's just something we get used to saying. Listen, here's what Christ is, and I want to talk about it for a little bit and explain why it affects you, why it's important. Christ is the official name that Jesus has that defines his unique role in God's plan. Christ is a special name that applies only to Jesus. There is only one Christ, and it's Jesus. He has a special, unique role, a purpose in God's plan in history. Christ is an English word, obviously, that we use, but it was based upon a Greek word uh, in the New Testament here, Christos. Well, that Greek word, we're going to backtrack one more, is really the, the exact same word as a Hebrew word that means Messiah. So when you hear the word Christ, it is the same word, Messiah. It is the word that defines why Jesus came to earth in the first place. Who was he? What is he supposed to do? We've heard that term Messiah. It's the Old Testament Hebrew term for a promised Savior of the world. There was one that was promised years past by the prophets of God, uh, this this Savior that was coming, this, this unique individual that would be a prophet, a priest, and a king. Somebody that was different than anyone else that was coming to rule the nation. Somebody that was going to be a son. Someone that was coming to be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. This, this Christ is this Messiah. The word Messiah, it means anointed one. Can you say anointed one? All right, we're going to get some participation here, so we're going to try that again. Can you say anointed one? Anointed one. Thank you. This is awesome. This is good. Hey, if we get any further, maybe I'll just have you all stand up, and we'll just, uh, no, I'm not going to do that today. Uh, anointed one. That's what it means. It means Anointed. Now, when you, you've, how many have heard that term anointed before? You understand that term? Anointed, if you see in the Old Testament, you think of Samuel, and he would go, Samuel was uh, one of God's prophets. He was there as God's men, and he would anoint the king. The idea is they would pour some oil on their head. They would indicate that this person was consecrated for God's service. That's what anointing is. It's a, it's a choosing. It's a special consecrating that when this person's anointed, They have a specific role to fill. God has chosen them out. God has placed them in a certain spot in history for such a time as this. That's what anointed is. Jesus Christ is Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the anointed one. What I'm saying today is that Jesus was chosen by God for a specific purpose. Let me explain. I, I want to I look back uh, because some of you, maybe you haven't heard the prophecies. Hundreds of years before Christmas, this birth of Jesus ever happened, there were prophets in different places of the world uh, writing about this Messiah, this coming Christ. Uh, in Genesis 3.15, we have this thing we call the first gospel, the prophecy of that there would be a virgin birth uh, and that there would uh, be salvation uh, through this virgin birth. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, at the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned against God. Sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned, right? Adam and Eve sinned. God, in the very next chapter, issues a promise that one day there will be a special person coming by the seed of a woman, a virgin seed, and this person will bruise the head of the serpent or Satan uh, from this story. In Genesis 12, we read uh, the prophecy uh, that a savior of the world would come through the lineage of Abraham. Let me read it to you. And I will bless them. Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee, Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. We we, we read already in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, when the angel came, the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day 
in the city of David a Savior. Long before Jesus was ever born, there were prophets saying, listen, there is someone coming. He's got a specific job, and he is coming to be the Savior of the world. It was before Jesus was born. It was coming through Abraham. Uh, Some of you, when you go through your Bible, uh, how many of you like to try to read your Bible through each year? Anyone like to do that? It's a great goal to try and do. Uh, Sometimes you get like to Matthew chapter 1 and there's these things called genealogies, right? And it's like this person and then like lists all their family. It's like a big family tree list. Well, that whole family tree list was proving that Jesus would be born through the lineage of Abraham. We we see the prophecy and we see it fulfilled. Um, In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, the Bible says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Years before Jesus was ever born, the prophet Isaiah was prophesying, there would one day come a son who would be the Mighty God. And that's the picture we see at Christmas, that God left heaven, became Jesus. We're not just teaching that there was just a baby in the past named Jesus, and we kind of celebrate his birthday on Christmas. We're saying that there was God in heaven before the world began, and God in heaven at the time of Christmas, the very first Christmas, came to earth born as a baby through a virgin, and that's who Jesus is, that he was a special baby, that he was a unique baby, that he had a a special purpose for his life as the Christ, the Messiah. In Isaiah 53, this Messiah was, was, uh, he was described as a suffering servant, someone who would bear our transgressions on himself. Isaiah 53, verse number three, the Bible says he is despised. He is rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, we esteemed him not. Listen to this description. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Long before Jesus ever made it, incarnate here on earth in the flesh, there was somebody prophesying that there was this Messiah coming, this person, this special, unique individual that would fulfill God's purpose to take on our transgressions, to take on all of our sin. In Micah 5, 2, uh, the Bible talks about that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. In Isaiah 7, 14, uh, explains that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born and, and called God with us, Emmanuel, a prophet prophesied that he would be born of a virgin and have that name. Uh, in Jeremiah 31, even as far as when Jesus was born and, and Herod recognized this Messiah was born, he came in to try and slaughter the babies in a certain area uh, so that he would hopefully kill this Jesus. That was even prophesied in Jeremiah 31. Here's the thing I'm trying to tell you. This prophecy about Jesus is a big deal. Uh, this prophecy about Jesus, it, it's what makes Jesus' birth different than any other birth. It was a pre-planned, executed plan of God. It was something God orchestrated that was prophesied throughout history, and it took place and was fulfilled in Jesus' birth. Jesus of Nazareth, being able to fill, fulfill just eight of the prophecies about the Messiah. It, so there was, um, I, I believe, around 60 uh, really specific prophecies but if some one person were to fulfill only eight of those prophecies the the odds are one out of 10 to the 17th power it's like one with 17 zeros or 10 with 17 zeros these are the same odds as if you took the state of texas you covered it in silver dollars two feet deep You take one of those silver dollars, you mark it differently than all the other silver dollars and just toss it out in the state of Texas. You take somebody, you blindfold them and you say, hey, I want you to go out on the first try. You walk any direction you want and I want you to pick up that one coin. Say, how how could anybody fulfill these prophecies? Just eight of them, that's the odds. Jesus was miraculous with his birth. It was prophesied, he fulfilled a specific purpose that God had planned and predetermined. Uh, It's incredible. 
At Christmas, Jesus fulfilled these prophecies in his birth. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He was presented gifts from kings, which was prophesied in Psalm 72.10. And his name was called Jesus, uh, and he will save his people from their sins, which recognizes that prophecy in Isaiah 53, that he will uh, take on our transgressions and, and bear our griefs. Jesus fulfilled his, uh, his job, his role as the Christ at Christmas. But I want to tell you this, Christmas isn't the only time where we see Jesus fulfilling what he was called to do. Uh, The Bible actually records a time when Jesus was 12 years old. Now, uh, how many of you parents in here, this is confession time, have ever lost your children? Maybe you like left and left them behind or you lost them kind of, you're kind of good looking. Raise your hand, parents look around, kind of console one another. Listen, um... I have never, ever lost my kids. Listen, uh, my wife and I joke about this, and I probably am the only one that can joke about this. You're not allowed to. Uh, My son is 10, and he uses a wheelchair, and we often joke with him like we're not concerned for him to get stolen or lost or taken. Nobody has taken my son in his 400-pound wheelchair, all right? Uh, I have an, an Apple AirTag on his wheelchair, so I know where he is. I like, go where you want. I'm not going to lose you. I'm not worried about it. And uh, it's, it's kind of a fun uh, blessing in the midst of uh, some difficulty. But when Jesus was 12 years old, uh, his family was uh, in Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. And they had left. They were with a group of people, some caravan. They were kind of traveling together. And they got kind of far away. And they realized, <gasps> where's Jesus? He's not with us. Can you imagine? You lost your kids. Those of you parents that need some help, you're losing your kids. Did you find, how many of you parents found your kids? I sure hope you did. Okay. Um, so he's lost. They backtrack, go back to the temple. And the Bible says uh, that he was there and he was uh, speaking with these doctors, these wise men. And he was answering their questions. He was in the temple teaching. Um, and his mother and his stepfather were looking for him, and here's what Jesus says to them. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not, which is like an old English way of saying, don't you know? Uh, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? At 12 years old, Jesus, the Christ, understood that he had a purpose. He said, I know what I am here to do. I am about my father's business. I, what else do you think I would be doing? I, I am here for a reason. Uh, Jesus uh, knew he was set about and he was on earth to live out God's purpose. At 30 years old, fast forward, we see Jesus uh, continuing to fill that role as Christ as he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and baptized. This is so important. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says about Jesus, uh, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, or allowed him to be baptized. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, when he got was baptized, he, they put him down under the water, right? They pulled him back up out of the water. And visually, there was a visual that showed that Jesus was the chosen one of God, that he was the Christ, that he was anointed. God was preparing him and equipping him for the ministry at hand. At the beginning of his ministry, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit came and descended upon him. And God says audibly, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I point this out because this is where Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. This is where Jesus was declared to say, this is the one. Uh, John, uh, who was baptizing him, said that there was one who was, uh, he's not even worried to like unlatch his shoes, that there was this uh, Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He was recognizing that this one that was God's son and whom he was well pleased was the Messiah, was the Christ. At 33 years old, just fast forward toward the end of Jesus' ministry, 
Jesus had the ability to say, God, I've done what you've called me to do. Just before he died on the cross, Jesus uh, gives us a little bit of insight that we can learn from. Matthew 26, verse 39. Jesus is in the garden, this garden, and he's praying. And he's praying about what he's about to go through on the cross, this death on the cross. I mean, how would you be feeling if you were facing uncertainty and uh, the pain and everything that would come through this death on the cross? The Bible says Jesus, he went a little further. He fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus, he, he's praying. Uh, Jesus had no, no doubt he knew he was the Messiah. At 12, he knew what he was meant to be doing. He knew that he was the Christ. He had a job to do. But he's saying, God, I know what you're calling me to do, but take this cup from me. I, I, if, if at all possible, you know, Jesus was 100% human and he was 100% God. He cried. He was hungry. He slept. And here, he knew what was coming up. He knew the pain. He knew the agony. He knew his cross to bear. But Jesus, he, he's praying intimately with God, and we get to kind of listen to his prayer. And he says, God, please take this cup from me. But I, I don't want to experience what you're asking me to experience. But he says this, nevertheless, not as I will. It's not what I want. But as thou Wilt. He said, God, if, if it's possible, if there's another way you can save your people from their sins, take this from me. But he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In John, uh, in John 19 30, we get to, uh, we f fast forward, and Jesus was mocked, he was beaten, he was scourged, he was uh, made fun of, he was placed on that cross. The Bible talks about how it went dark. Uh, for three hours in that day, and all of your sin, everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said wrong, everything you've ever, every time you've ever cursed God, everything that you look back on your life with regret on, all the sin that you've committed between a, uh, against a holy God, all of that sin was placed upon Jesus. The Bible says that God judged Jesus, the, in, the innocent man he judged for us, the guilty. He was in our place. He was our substitute there on the cross. John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said on the cross, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What was finished? What did Jesus finish on the cross? Jesus finished exactly what he was sent to do. From everything before with the prophets that was prophesying about the Christ and the Messiah, to the birth of his birth, to his death, he said, it's finished. I've, I've come to do my Messiah job, and it is finished. I am uh, saving people from their sins. He completed his role of being the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Three days after je death, after already paying for the sins of the world, including yours and mine, he proved his own power over death by rising from the grave, defeating death. That's awesome. And he, he, he proves that, listen, there is hope that death is not the end, that death is not final, that there is life beyond the grave. See, the purpose of Jesus' life was to accomplish God's purpose. Will you agree with me on that? Yeah. That's why he came. He came because God had something for him to do, to save people from their sins. In Matthew chapter 1, Jesus was given his name. Matthew 1, 21, and, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. He will be the Messiah. He will be the Christ, the one we've waited for, the one that died for us and rose again. I want to pause before I go any further in the message because I want to say this, that Jesus has already done everything necessary to save you from your sins. You may be sitting in here, and I cannot see your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, right? I can see what you look like, whether you're smiling, you know, whether you look tired or awake. I can see the outside, but I can't see on the inside. I cannot see your relationship and your standing with God today. 
I don't know if you know him. I don't know if your sins are forgiven or if you still, like the Bible says, stand in this position of wrath. The wrath of God abides on you. You see, every one of us is born in our sin. We all, we all are born and nobody has to teach us to lie, to steal, to cheat, to do whatever. We sin naturally. But you have to come to a point in your life where you hear about Jesus, the Christ, the one who died on the cross to save you from your sin. Jesus didn't just die for fun. He wasn't just born on Christmas for decorations. He was born and he died and he rose again for you so that your sin could be forgiven. Do you hear me? You have sin before God. And there is a punishment for that sin. And if you do not recognize who the Christ is, you will miss the purpose of Christmas. You will miss the purpose of your life, the very purpose to know God. I want to put it out here today and ask you, have you experienced the Messiah? Have you experienced what Christ came for, and that is to die for you and save you? Do you experience total forgiveness in your life? Some of you came in here today and you, you're wondering if this church thing is for you or you're wondering hey, if this God thing is for you. I want to tell you that God offers to you the opportunity to have total forgiveness for your sin. You do not need to feel guilty. You do not need to feel shame. You do not need to feel bad. You do not need to continue to try to do good things so that God will like you. You do not need to come to church or go through these ritualistic things just hoping that maybe your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. What he said is, I did everything necessary for you to be saved. There's not one more thing that you can do to be saved besides believe and have faith. Have you received Jesus as your Savior, as the Messiah, do you have hope for eternal life after this one? This is not the end of my message, but here in a little bit, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to sing a song. If you're in here today and you say, I do not know if I would die today if I'd go to heaven or hell, I'm not sure. I have a question. I'm going to invite you to come forward and talk to one of our uh, prayer people up here. Talk to myself. We want to help you get that answer. Listen, you can watch a hundred Hallmark movies, send a hundred Christmas cards, spend all the money you have in your bank account for Christmas presents, but if you get to the end of this Christmas season and you leave today not knowing Jesus as your Savior, you've wasted your time. You've wasted the opportunity God gave you. Everywhere you go right now, you hear Christmas. You hear Christmas songs in the store. You Christmas songs on the radio. You, you get to see mangers that you drive by, and all of those things are not there just to give you a good feeling and make you feel happy. All of those things are pointing to the fact that there is a Christ, a Savior that was promised, that came and died for you, and you need him. Now I'm going to continue my message. Listen, so many of us waste our lives with this thing called when and then thinking. When and then. What we believe is that when this or that happens, then we will really start living and do something for God that really matters. Maybe you're when and then thing. He says, you know, when things get a little bit better, then I'll come to God for salvation. Or when, when the kids grow up, or when I get through this season at work, then I'll live for God. Listen, just as Jesus had a purpose for his life, you have a purpose in your life. Here's your purpose. It's really twofold. Number one, first is to know him. To know him. If you don't know God, that is your number one priority today. The only way we know God is by knowing his son Jesus, who died for us and rose again. And all we have to do is simply come to him by faith. We say, God, I believe that you are who you say you are, that you died for me, that you rose again, and I'm placing my faith in you. Please forgive me for my sin. Take me to heaven when I die. Save me. I believe you. After you know him, he's got one purpose for your life. That's to live for him, to live for him. Uh, this is a hard thing to, to preach because I, I, can't, um, I can't tell you specifically what that means. Um, I know that living for him uh, means fellowshipping with other believers. I know living for him means to be holy and set apart. I know living for him means to be thankful. It means to walk in the spirit, which we're going to talk about in a moment. I know there's certain things the Bible says living for him. We, we talk about him. But living for him is a heart direction change. It's, it's where I say, it's not about me anymore. Not my will, but thine be done. It's, it's, a, it's a point where you just change the reason for being. 
The reason for existing, the reason you have conversation, the the reason you set goals, the why behind it all. God's purpose for you is to live for him. And as the Messiah, Jesus gives us an example of how to accomplish God's purpose for our lives. He knew it when he was a kid. He knew it uh, when when he was older and he lived focused on what God had for him to do. Two facts about your purpose and I'll be done today. Number one, you are created on purpose. You are created on purpose. That means there's purpose in your birth. You say, I, I showed up as just an accident. Listen, Jesus' circumstances were not on accident. Neither were yours. His, who his parents were, not an accident. How his birth came to be. Not an accident. Where he grew up in this little town called Nazareth as a carpenter's son with a stepfather. Uh, It's not an accident. In the womb, before uh, our birth, God knows us and has a purpose for us. Did you know that? In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The Bible says God looks at us as a a, a work in progress, something that that he's building, designing. And he says, I've created you for a purpose, good works, and I've ordained it before. I've chosen that there is a path which you should follow. There is a direction in which you should go. In Psalm 139, we're reminded, verse 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Listen, God doesn't make accidents in how he made you, who he made you to be, where he put you, and where your upbringing happens. God has a purpose for you. You are created on purpose. Jeremiah 1.5 gives us this example. It says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Listen, if if God knows a prophet and what he wants him to do before he was born, the same is true with us, that God has something for you to do. And the reason you exist on this planet is because God has a purpose for you. And you've got to find that out. I want to speak to the parents for just a moment. Parents, your job in this world is to help your kids understand that God has a purpose for them in this world. Do you understand that? I wonder, do your kids know that life is more than sports? Life is more than extracurricular activities that somebody at school determines should be on a schedule. Life is more than video games. Life is more than education, entertainment, getting a good job so that you can pay the bills. It's not about just making a living. It's about a life that you have for God's purpose. I wonder, have you considered, why are your kids here? Why are your kids here? Because if you're not asking the question, what does God want for my kids to do, then you won't be able to teach your kids that God has something for them to do. Why are your kids here? What could God want them to do? What could the purpose be? What specific thing could God have them to do? Have you led your children to consider God's purpose for their life? Or have you taught them that life is all about themselves? We ask these questions and and culture and school brings us up to say, what do you want to do when you get older? What do you want to be when you grow up? Hey, what do you feel like doing today? It's not, life is not about what we feel or what we want. You understand? Life is about what does God want for us? Now he's going to use your desires. He's going to use your talents. He's going to use your ambition. He's going to use your skill. He's going to use the specific place where he has you. But it's about asking the question, God, what do you want? Not about what, that's not about us. It's not about what we want. Parents, have you considered God's purpose for your own life? Listen, we can't teach our kids what we're not doing. If we're caught up in simply gaining things here on this earth, what kind of car am I going to drive? Am I going to have good retirement? Am I going to take good vacations? Am I going to provide great presents at Christmas? Listen, those are all the wrong things. There are things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek him first and then the things come. We have to be cautious that our focus is not off of God and on to the things. You are created on purpose. When the Bible says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, we just need to realize that when it comes to parenting our kids, 
we, we, we grew up insecure about things. Anybody ever here get made fun of? Yeah? Hate getting made fun of. Man, that stinks. <laughs> I can feel it. You, you remember that time you got made fun of or something uh, about you that you weren't too sure about, the way you looked or, uh, you know, um, uh, whether you were preaching on Sunday and your pants were too tight uh, or, yeah, sorry, this is not a counseling session. Listen, um, you know how that makes you feel, insecure. You, you, you feel like, how could I be good? And you start comparing yourself to other people. And then you get on Facebook and you see how everybody else is happy, but you don't feel happy for some reason. And you see everybody else and what they get for Christmas and you're not, you're not happy for some reason. And you're, our kids are growing up in a world that they're meant to compare themselves and, and idolize uh, some perfect image that's really just a filter that they saw on TikTok or on Instagram. We need to be the people that explain to our children that God made them the way they are and it's good and it's right. That they don't have to change themselves. That they don't have to adjust to what somebody else looks like or how they feel. That God made them perfectly, fearfully and wonderfully made and he created them with a purpose. You are created on purpose. But here's my second point. You are anointed for a purpose. All throughout scripture... Where God's presence was, that's where God, God's power was and God worked. That's why it's so important when Jesus was baptized that the Holy Spirit came, descended upon him, and that was the start of his earthly ministry of healing and doing miracles and all these things. The Holy Spirit was evidence of God's anointing. You follow me? Jesus received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was a sign of God's blessing, of God's choosing, of God separating him for service. God dwells where he works. God's presence is evidence of his desire to work. Uh, in the Old Testament, they would want to steal the Ark of the Covenant back and forth between people and these, these nations where, where God's presence was, the power was at it. it. It was something to be desired, that God would be with them in person, present. Here's the point. If you are a believer, you too are anointed. See, Jesus was the anointed one, the chosen one. He had a specific reason for being. He was the Christ. God had a specific goal for his life. But you know what? Now, uh, Jesus, we always talk about Jesus is working. God is here. God is moving here. Jesus is here. The truth is, Jesus, uh, when he died, he, he raised again bodily, and he, in his body, rose back up to heaven. He is actually not here. Jesus is up in heaven. Uh, he, he prays for us. He makes intercession for us. He's up in heaven uh, preparing uh, some awesome place for us to go to. But the Bible says when he goes, it's good that he goes because he has another one that's going to come. The Bible calls it a comforter. Somebody else is going to come who's going to be doing the work now. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. And the thing about you being anointed is that in the past, they used to want to get this Ark of the Covenant and get God's physical presence with them. The truth is this, that if you know Jesus, you are the temple of God. And the Holy Spirit of God, the one that has his blessing, the one that has his anointing, that, that, that shows that God wants to work there, that God wants to use whatever, wherever he is present, that he's inside of you. It indicates to me that God wants to use you, that God wants to uh, have you serve him, that God has called you and chosen you to serve him. When Jesus was baptized, he received the Spirit as evidence of his anointing as the Messiah. He was the chosen one of God. And when you were saved and received the Holy Spirit, it was evidence that you too are his anointed, called and chosen to serve him. 1 Corinthians 6, listen to this. Verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body is God's dwelling place. He has chosen to live within you because he wants to use you. Acts 1 verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. How am I supposed to do what God wants me to do? How can I be a witness? How can I serve? How can I live for God? Because the Holy Spirit gives you the power. The power is with his presence, and his presence is with you. 
John 14, Jesus says, I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Then I'm not talking about the comforter on your bed. Listen, when we read comforter in the Bible, don't get confused about comforter. Comforter is a person. Comforter is the Holy Spirit that lives within you. It's not the one that's meant to make you feel good like that. Oh, I'm, I'm comfortable. It's the one that when you're going through difficulty, yes, he does comfort you. But he is the one that empowers you, strengthens you, walks with you, stays with you. When God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, it's because the Holy Spirit lives inside you. God wants to work in you. Matthew 1, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. When Jesus was born on this earth, he was in the flesh. His disciples could see him. His disciples could be present with him, could look him in the eye. God was with them. Well, we have God with us. Jesus is back in heaven, but we have the Holy Spirit of God. We can pray. He talks to us. He guides us. He leads us. He speaks to us. I, I love this verse because Pastor Tony often asks us to pray this verse. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Listen, God, we, we pray, God, do something. Do something uh, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Well, he wants to. He wants to do something. But you know who he uses to do those things? You. And the power that comes is the power that works in you. God wants to use you to do his work in this world. He has a purpose for you, and he's equipped you and empowered you to do it. And it will be greater than anything you could ask or think. My question for you today is simply this. When it comes to knowing that you're created for a purpose, that you were anointed for a purpose, do you believe it? Do you believe it? You know, how we believe affects how we live. If you don't believe God has something for you, you're going to waste your time. You're going to spend all your money on empty things. You're going to go through Christmas and think, oh, let's, let's just have fun. You know, that's all there is to life. Listen, if you believe that God has a purpose for you, you will live differently. You will spend your money differently. You will sp spend your time differently. You will set different priorities. You will have different goals for your life. Do you believe it? Do you have faith in the verses uh, that God is always with you, that God gives you power? Are you walking in the Spirit? Here, here's what I want to encourage you with today is that God has equipped you for exactly where you are right now. say, but how I got here is so messed up. Uh, Jesus' birth wasn't uh, the prettiest story, you know. Looking all around for a place to stay, no room in the inn, having to sleep in a, a manger of hay. You know, it sounds nice and pretty when you have, and make nice songs and light candles, uh, but it probably wasn't a great experience. And the, the truth is that it may, it may not look pretty, it may not go the greatest, but God has you here for a purpose in your life right now. He has you to focus on what he has for you to do. You are enough for the task at hand because God has chosen you. You are anointed as Jesus was anointed. My message today is simple. I want to sum it up in saying this. Number one, God had a purpose for Jesus, the Christ. Don't just say Jesus Christ without understanding that that's Jesus, the Savior of the world, the promised Messiah. God had a purpose for Jesus, but God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for you. Don't miss God's purpose for you. Maybe you say, I, I think I know maybe what God's purpose is for me, but I'm scared. Don't be scared. You've got a comforter. You've got the power. You've got an anointing. God has placed you where you are for a reason. And some, uh, God places us in places because that's the only, we're the only ones that can be in that place. Nobody can accomplish what God has me to accomplish. Nobody can accomplish what God has you to accomplish. God has you specifically in a spot for a reason. I want to close with this illustration. I heard this a while back. It just helped me to understand it. Um, the illustration goes this way. It says that life is a lot like shooting arrows, okay? Uh, imagine that each one of us, uh, with our decisions, with our, how we spend our money, with how we spend our time, we're, we're shooting arrows, firing 
every decision we make, every step we take, everything we do, the motives we have, all of those things are shooting arrows at a target. Our schedules, our goals, our plans, everything, everything is an arrow. We're taking shots at a target. The thing is, God has a purpose for your arrows. God has something he wants to do with them. But but the truth is today that at the end of our life, the only thing that will matter is whether you accomplish God's purpose for your life or not. And some of us, sadly, may have lived a whole life and we get to the end and we realize we're shooting our arrows, but we're shooting them at the wrong target. We're not, we're not facing the right direction. And if you are God's child, I just want to call you during this Christmas time. Do not get caught up in what the world would have you think Christmas is about. Do not get caught up in the fact that it's, it's all about stuff or it's just about a good time. There is a reason for your time on this earth, and God is that reason. And you need to figure out what he wants you to do, and you need to do it.